Oh dear, here I am again, eh? Oh, I know what I could do to cheer me up. I could put on the Christmas lights. Oh yes, <laughs> what a good idea. Oh, I can't wait, you know. I've been looking forward to this all year, my yearly job. Eh, what? They were on? Eh? Well, they're shit anyway. God, hello everyone. It's the 13th video in the Century Ecology series. Unlucky for some, but today we're going to scrap vision now. We've done all we can on it. In fact, we're going to turn back to a sense which we've already talked about a little bit, and that's electroreception. Now, last time when we talked about it, all those videos ago, we talked about it in terrestrial organisms, where the only animals being known are those bumblebees and how they use it um, to detect flowers. Yeah, it feels very interesting. But the place where electroreception is by far more abundant is underwater, and that's simply because water is a better conductor of electricity than air. Yeah, that's simple enough. So we talked about how electrical electroreception is the ability to perceive um, electrical stimuli. There's some basic physics, of course, an electric field is generated by two dipoles. You need a positive and a negative charge, okay, which I've drawn here, and field lines go from one to the other. When you're drawing this, the field lines always go from positive to negative, yeah? And they're attracted to each other due to Coulomb's law. This is therefore an electric dipole, and it's the density of these field lines between the two charges which determines the field strength, and that's measured in volts per centimetre. Okay. Now, if there's ever a change in that electric field, if something else gets introduced um, where those field lines are, that'll create a change in the field, and as a result, it will create a force on that field. So if there's a force, that means there's an acceleration, remember? Basic Newton's second law that says F equals MA. And that gives us some sort of stimuli for animals to be able to measure. Okay? Incredible. Now, why use it at all? Well, electroreception can often take the place of vision in many animals which live in particularly murky water, for example, or are nocturnal. Okay, it can be used in the detection, identification, and localization of objects, which you know is normally um, a job that our eyes do. And also, and that's something we're going to be talking about at the end of the video, it can also be used in electrocommunication. People can talk using electricity. It can also be used as a form of x ray vision, if you like. It can be used to penetrate substances and to detect buried prey. And we'll look at a perfect example of that later. Now, before we go any further, we've got to make clear that there are actually two types of electroreception, right? There's passive electroreception, which involves just the general picking up of already existing electrical stimuli. So all an animal has to have for this is just some form of electroreceptive sensors to detect those electric fields that other animals, for example, are giving off. Okay? On the other hand, there's also active electroreception. That's when animals generate their own electric field around them. Okay? And any uh, break or change in that field, like how we showed in this diagram here, will result in a response. Now, we've been talking about electrical dipoles for, throughout this video. The next question is, are animals themselves dipoles? Well, dipoles are areas of opposite charges, of opposite electrical potentials. Well, we've known for a long time that cell membranes are very good at building up an electrical potential, and it's that which forms the basis of the nerve impulse, how an action potential propagates along a neuron. So cells are, in them, are themselves dipoles, if you like. This isn't the only place where we see dipoles. A lot of muscle activity relies on um, a potential difference. Right, so let's look at some pretty pictures of animals then. Who actually uses electroreception? And what's interesting is that most of the fish that use electroreception aren't actually teleos. Te okay, so the non-teleos groups are as follows then. There's the agnatha, 
the elasmobranchi, the holocephali, the chondroste, the polyptery, and dipnoi. And then the teleos groups are the siluriforms, the gymnotiforms, the more mirrorforms, and the xenomystinae. There are also some amphibian larvae that can do this as well. And mammals include the monotreme, so the platypus and the echidna. And finally, the Guyana dolphin. Right, so they're the animals can, that can do it then. Let's look at the actual receptors. That's what we really want to know. How on earth are these animals um, able to detect electric fields? Now the receptors are normally what we call secondary nerve cells. That means they don't have their own axon, okay? So as a result of that, that means they can't produce action potentials. Instead, they produce what we call a receptor potential, which gets transmitted along a synapse to an afferent nerve fiber, which then transmits action potentials. The current flows into the body following those electric field lines and that will alter the electric potential of those secondary nerve cells, which then results in an impulse. Of course you can do your usual electrophysiological measurements by inserting electrodes next to or into the afferent nerve fibre and recording those action potentials, recording the response to an electrical stimulus. You could do some pretty cool experiments with that. And what you find is, is that there's usually a normal excitation rate, okay? The action potentials, there's always action potentials firing at a constant rate. So that means when an electrical stimulus is introduced, that firing rate can increase or decrease, and the animal can then respond accordingly. So for example, if a positive charge is introduced, the spike rate usually increases, if a negative charge is introduced, the um, spike rate normally decreases. So you've got a good system there, okay? There are two types of responses that these afferent nerve fibers could have. There's a phasic response. That means that that neuron adapts very quickly to the electrical stimulus. So it returns quite quickly to the standard rate, the standard spike rate. Whilst a tonic response is completely the opposite. It takes a long time to adapt. It carries on firing um, at an increased rate if there's a positive charge or at a decreased rate if there's a negative charge. But of course there's variability in the system depending on what animals we're looking at. For teleosts, for example, there's an increase in spike rate with field strength, but for things like states, so the elasmobranchs, there's a decrease in spike rate. So let's go into specifics then. Let's look into our first receptor organs and these are in the lampreys, a weird group of fish, admittedly. And because things like lampreys can be described as primitive in relation to other fish, they have actually got quite a simple system here. Okay, so what they have are these things called epidermal end buds, which contains around 3 to 30 sensory cells. So there's quite a lot of variability there. Okay, and these cells have a lot of microvilli which are exposed to the water. So, as usual in biology, that's to increase surface area. So that's all very well then. If there's an electric field present, there's a response. If there isn't one, there isn't a response, okay? Pretty simple. Now things get a little bit more sophisticated in the cartilaginous fish, the chondrichthyes. Okay, the chondrichthyes are what groups together the elasmobranchs and the holocephali. Okay, they've got probably the nicest named organ, the ampullae of Lorenzini. So these are mucus filled ducts which are open at the outer end and have a receptor at the base. And they basically act like an antennae. Okay, and the distribution of the field lines in space determines the response of these receptors. So that means this is one step better than the lampreys because these now have directionality. Now in the teleos fish, the electroreceptors are simply called ampullary organs, and there's huge diversity um, within the teleos. Well, teleos are extremely diverse after all, but the structure of these ampullary organs does differ. The most common one is the tuberous um, receptors, 
which don't actually consist of a duct at all. Instead, this is just a plug of loosely packed epidermal cells. Those cells have lots of microvilli and work in the same way electrically to all the others, okay? They're covered in a layer of mucus, just like the others. They're quite similar, really. For all the other ampullary organs in Telios fish, it would normally consist of ampullae at the end of a duct, and this is where the nerve cells are. Okay, so just like with the ampullae of Lorenzini, we've got directionality here. So an animal is able to detect where that um, object is that's emitting that electric field or changing its own electric field. Okay, very good. Now, when it comes to things like the platypus, you've got something a little bit different here. Their electroreceptors are modified mucus glands. Which makes sense really because in the receptors of the teleosts and the chondrichthys, these involve mucus filled ducts. So that's sensible, isn't it? And here inside these mucus glands, there are free nerve endings which directly interact with the electric field. Okay, okay, so that's the basics of the receptors there. There's really nothing too taxing there. And that's because all these electroreceptors are really quite similar. And that's because they're all doing similar jobs. Most of these animals are using um, electroreception for the detection and localization of objects. So that means all the receptors have to fit all the correct criteria. Now what differs between animals is the distribution of these receptors on the body. And that, of course, depends on their ecology. This is sensory ecology after all. So, for example, if you're something like a shark, or a hammerhead shark, for example, with, you know, a long head full of receptors, those um, animals are looking for fish that are hidden on the sea floor under sand and whatnot. Okay? So that means the distribution of these electroreceptors, the ampullae of Lorenzini, are mostly on the ventral side of the body. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you're trying to detect a flatfish or something hidden under the sand, then there's no point in having electroreceptors pointing upwards, <laughs> right? If you look at something called the sandbar shark, which is a more pelagic um, species, so it could be detecting um, fish from upwards or downwards, then there's a more or less a 50-50 distribution of electroreceptors. Um, on the ventral and the dorsal side of the body. So most of these electroreceptors are for detecting objects, so electrolocation, if you like. Now, of course, there's two different types of electrolocation as well. There's passive and active electrolocation. So let's look at passive first, and a brilliant, absolutely classic experiment which helped to demonstrate this was done by Carl Mijin, if that's how you pronounce his name, in 1971 on cat sharks, okay? This is really quite a simple experiment and it tells us an awful lot. So this was probably done in an aquarium, I'm imagining, where these cat sharks were kept. And these cat sharks were introduced with loads of different stimuli. So they started off by introducing um, a dead fish. These are ventral hunting species. They normally find um, prey that are hidden underneath the sand, okay? So the question was, how on earth do they detect buried prey underneath the sand if they can't see them, okay? So what they did is that they stuck a dead fish underneath the sand. And this fish was kept in an agar chamber. Now what's that for? Well, an agar chamber excludes any chemical stimuli. So it gets rid of the possibility that the shark would be able to smell the fish that's hidden underneath the sand, because that would completely ruin the experiment, right? So what they found was that the shark couldn't detect the fish. And why is that? Well, it's because it was dead, okay? There's no heartbeat, there's no muscle movements. That means there's no electric field generated by a dead animal. So that means the shark couldn't detect it. Next what they did is that they shoved two electrical dipoles in the agar chamber and put it underneath the sand. Okay, so these are basically two electrodes generating an electric field. And what did they find? 
Well, the sharks went for them, of course. And more interestingly, the sharks chose these electric dipoles over actual live prey. Okay, but that's presumably because these electric dipoles were generating a bigger electric field. So that was suggesting to the shark that, Jesus, God, there's a big meal under there, I'm going to go and get it. Okay, so this really is conclusive proof that these sharks are using the electric fields emitted by their prey in order to detect them. Okay, there's no vision because they're buried underneath the sand, they can't see the fish. There's no chemical stimuli, there's no olfaction. Um, because of the agar chamber. Okay, so what about active electrolocation then? Well, as mentioned earlier, that's when an electric field is actually generated by the animal itself. And any change in, in that electric field generated by an object um, coming in and coming across the field lines, that will be picked up by um, the animal. Okay, so objects modify the field depending, though, on their impedance. So it's electroreceptive organs in the skin which pick up the changes and then these then get transmitted to the CNS which interprets the input. Okay? So say if something which is more conductive enters the electric field produced by a particular animal. Well that means the field lines will get closer together, it will get stronger. Okay? And vice versa if there's something less conductive. So that already gives these animals something to work on. Now a guy called Pereira did some work on this in 2012. So what they did, they measured the response strength of those nerve fibres when a stimulus presented at different parts of the body. So a stimulus was presented in front of the body, to the sides of the body, at 45 degrees, 135 degrees, and so on, all around the body. Okay? And what they found was that the response strength was greatest when the stimulus is in front. And that's because there's usually a greater density of receptors at the front of the body, at the head. Okay? Which makes sense, because that's nearest the mouth. And if an animal is trying to detect prey, well, it's going to want to use its mouth, isn't it? Clearly. Um, now, there's several different types of behaviours that fish use to make sure that head is in a perfect position for detecting prey. This, what well, first thing is this side searching. And this gives an indication on how short range this form of sensing is, okay? If you go a far enough distance away, then the response strength against different parts of the body is pretty much the same, okay? But if the species density is great enough anyway, this isn't really an issue, okay? If you're detecting um, objects which are relatively quite close to you, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so electrogenesis then. How does it actually work exactly? Um, it must be pretty good because it's evolved more than once. It's thought to have evolved six independent times in fish. And we know that because the organs that are involved are all in different positions. Okay? So, it must be useful for something. Now, we must classify this into two different types of electrogenesis, okay? They're what we call the weakly electric fish and the strongly electric fish, okay? The weakly electric fish use the electric field that they produce um, just for object detection, okay? And localization of prey objects, things like that. The strongly electric fish, well, they include things like the ever popular electric eel, of course, which uses their electric field to stun prey. Okay, pretty vicious. And they can also be used in defence by some fish as well. Now, the fish do have a problem here because, of course, animals internally produce their own electric fields. So, whilst they're producing, this electric field surrounding them to detect objects, there will be some noise produced by muscle activity, heartbeat, things like that. And that's going to disrupt that the, ele the electric field that they're producing. So what do they do then? Well, they tend to keep, in general, muscle activity to a minimum and keep things like that away from those receptors that are detecting the electric field. There's all sorts of behavioural responses as well, such as an undulating motion of swimming and things like that. 
But anyway, let's get on to the nitty gritty then, shall we? The electric eel, undoubtedly the most famous and most impressive example of electroreception in the whole of the animal kingdom. So let's see how it works. Well, electric eels can generate between 300 to 650 volts of electrical organ discharges. That's EOD for short. And that is quite a lot, believe me. Enough to um, wipe you off your feet, certainly, and potentially kill you, okay? Brilliant. And how do they do this then? Well, they do that by basically stacking batteries. If you ever did physics, even at GCSE, you know if you stack batteries next to each other, you will increase the voltage, obviously, okay? Because the voltage of each battery adds up. So if you add three batteries, each of three volts, then you'd get nine volts in your circuit, okay? Well, that is basically what the electric eel's done, only that they evolved it millions and millions of years before we invented the battery, okay? They have these things called electrocytes, and each electrocyte can build up between 100 to 150 millivolts. Okay, which doesn't seem like a lot, but remember, as I say, if you stack them up against each other, those voltages add up. Okay. And these electrocytes are basically derived muscle cells. They're very specialised indeed. Now, the thing which builds up this electrical potential in each electrocyte is because motor neurons only connect to one side. Okay, so it charges up one side, but not the other. Well, there you go then, that's what creates a battery. From one side of the cell to the other, you've got a potential difference, a voltage. Okay, so as you say, by stacking them up, you can get up to 2,000 to 6,500 electrocytes per column. So you can imagine, you can do the maths presumably, how that will give you this 300 to 650 volts, okay? But also, it's not just one big stack of electrocytes, you've also got rows as well, okay? Further increasing the current, okay? So it's the stacks of electrocytes which increase the voltage, it's the amount of rows you have which increases the current. And that leads to a pretty impressive electric shock, which these electric, which electric eels produce when they want to stun their prey. And all of this was basically summarised by Gotter et al. in 1998. Now, some other people called Albert and Crampton in 2005 looked into this a little bit further. Now, what the electric uh, eel can do, it can send off um, and the impulse to those motor neurons as a single click, or it can send it as a series of clicks, okay? And if when you send it as a series of clicks, what you get, you can measure it, and what you get is your sinusoidal wave. So this means a spectral analysis can be undertaken, and you begin to see something which is quite similar to what we've talked about in the acoustics, in terms of the frequency of um, this impulse, okay? So what you get is a dominant frequency and various overtones, harmonic overtones. Synchronization of receptors is crucial there, and this is where a potential problem arises, okay? Because if you want to synchronize the discharge of all those thousands of electrocytes, you've got a problem, because each of those motor neurons is at a slightly different distance from the brain, okay? So that means some action potentials will arrive quicker than other action potentials. So what the brain has to do then, or what the nervous system has to do, is to resolve this. A common solution is that motor neurons which are closer to the brain actually make themselves longer by taking detours around the body. Okay. Some nerves have dif different uh, impulse speeds than other ones. So if you have nerves with different propagation speeds, that allows for impulses to arrive at the same time, which is you know, quite useful. There's also a thing called compensating synaptic delay, which occurs at synapses, but we don't need to go into that. Now, an interesting behavior relating to this is this idea of jamming avoidance. 
So imagine it, you've got two fish which are generating their own electric field and they come into close contact with each other. So their electric fields interact. Okay, that's going to create a problem because it acts as a disadvantage to both individuals. That means they can't detect objects as well. What we get is something called the jamming avoidance response, where there's an increase in impulse rate and a change in wave frequency. Okay, so one goes up, the other goes down. So that means they're generating their electric fields at different frequencies to each other. So that means there's less interference of the, each of their individual electric fields. It's quite clever. And this was studied by Zumpank and Bullock in 2006. So obviously the reasons for this are in electrocommunication. It's communication with conspecific, so they can work together, if you like. Okay, now experiment was done by these guys in knife fish, so this is a type of weakly electric fish. And what they did, they inserted an electrode which emitted an electric field at a particular frequency. And they watched how the electric field generated by the knife fish changed. And what they aimed for was around a 3 hertz difference in frequency. Now what is interesting as this experiment went on and the electric field produced by the electrode was still generating the electric field, well the knife fish got a bit fed up. They tried to encourage what they thought was another fish to um, but go up a little bit, okay? So it was slightly pushing the frequency of its electric field back up to where it should be, trying to encourage that other fish to move its electrical frequency up. Okay? So very, very sneaky, but obviously this is an electro, not an actual animal. So this poor knife fish was fighting a losing battle, quite frankly, because the electrode wasn't going to change its frequency. Right, so I mentioned dolphins earlier. To be honest, I'd be a bit of a fool if I didn't mention them again, didn't I? So the Guyana dolphin, as I said, is the only dolphin yet to be um, thought to be able to perceive electric fields, okay? And the receptors have been identified by this guy called Sech Damal in 2012. And these receptors are derived from bristles. There's a keratinous structure, there's no hair there anymore, but there's a keratinous structure with a different conductivity to the rest, which means uh, that electrical stimuli can be perceived, okay? And these are arranged longitudinally, just like all the other receptors we've been looking at, lots such as in the platypus and things like that. Okay, so how do you find out how they perceive this? Well, a behavioural experiment was carried out where these Guyana uh, dolphins were kept, um, probably again in an aquarium, and they were trained um, to enter a hoop, okay, so imagine there's a hoop which the dolphin sticks its head through, and that means its rostrum, its nose basically, is aligned with a pair of electrodes. Now those electrodes can emit an electric field, okay, of different field strengths, okay. So what the dolphins were trained to do is that when the electric field was present, they were trained to get their head out of the hoop and receive a food reward, okay. If there was no electric field present, then they got a food reward by not moving. Let me see if I can draw you what's going on. I mean, I've never drawn a dolphin in my life, but I guess that doesn't matter, does it? So, if there's an electric field, that dolphin's got to swim out the hoop and claim its food reward. If there is an electric field, then it just stays there. Okay? Simple. Now, what you find is, is that if there's a greater field strength, then there's a greater hit rate. The dolphin makes a greater number of correct choices and a sigmoid curve was produced. To work out the threshold, what you do is work out what the field strength was when the hit rate was 50%. Okay? So if you work out 50% and work your way down, you find that the threshold is around 4.5 microvolts per centimetre. So there you go then, who would have thought it? And who knows what other species of dolphin there are that can do this as well? And on that note, I'm going to leave you next time it's, we're actually going to look at a sense which we can do, believe it or not, and that's chemoreception. I'll see you then.